The best way to hack the system is through identifying one or two mentors. You don't need more than one or two. Mm -hmm. Just need to find the right people who, for whatever reason, are incentivized or motivated to spend time with you and show you the road. This episode is brought to you by Momento NFT. Momento NFT is a direct-to-fan social NFT app that allows fans to own viral moments from their favorite creators and unlock perks like meet and greets, autograph merchandise, and more. As a creator, you can easily create valuable images and video NFTs of your best social content. And as a fan, you can own viral moments from your favorite creators and unlock perks like meet and greets. Momento NFT is backed by Animoca brands Benza and Mark Pincus. Check out the app available on App Store and Google Play. Hi, Nicole. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. Hi, Grace. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. The TL there is like, you were originally from Greece. You went to Stanford. You went to uh, Cambridge and eventually joined Venture Capital after Stanford. And like, tell us more about like, you know, when you were growing up and, and then like the early period of your career that like, how did those experiences kind of shape you into who you are today? I was made in Greece, like Greek yogurt. <laughs> <laughs> and um, grew up between Greece and the UK. Growing up in Greece in the 90s and the early 2000s, I didn't know anyone who worked in tech startups, had never heard of the term venture capital. My parents um, are in the world of uh, medicine and academia. So I happened to be really good at studying math. So my best option was to go and become an engineer. And at the time in Greece, uh, the most ambitious uh, nerds, the only way out was to go and do a PhD at a top university in the US or in some of the other major European countries. During my undergrad studies in Greece, I had the fortune to meet with the president of IEEE, Institute of Electronic and Electrical Engineers, who was an American, was a professor at Tufts at the time, after having run an awesome career in uh, the industry. And his son was a biomedical devices um, engineering leader at a startup. So it happened that when I was in the fourth year of my studies, they invited me to go to Boston mm -hmm. to uh, visit them and uh, I got fortunate to secure a summer internship with a gentleman at the biomedical devices startup. And this is my first exposure for real to the world of startups. I found it pretty intriguing because it was like applied engineering work combined with entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. So while I was in Boston, I networked myself with professors at MIT and Harvard. And one of them was kind enough to sponsor me uh, to do my thesis for my undergrad in biomedical signal processing. So I stayed there because the first time when I was 22, 23 years old, I got exposure to tech startups and VC. But afterwards, I decided that this was not the best career option for me. Mm -hmm. Like, do a PhD and become a researcher. I found it like it would require an extreme uh, amount of perseverance and dedication to hang out with the same group of people again and again. I ended up flying to Tokyo. This was like a lifelong dream uh, for me as a young teenager to go live in Asia for a year, work over there as an engineer. Uh, and then I said, I'm too young to start working full time. So I decided to go back to school, went to Cambridge for a year, moved to California to go to Stanford in 2009. It was a great time because the app store was one year old and everybody and their mother were building a social network. <laughs> On certain days, mm -hmm. there were more VCs on campus at Stanford. And as my failing social networking startup wasn't going anywhere, one of them was kind enough, Chris Farmer, now the founder and CEO at SignalFire, to uh, invite me to come and join him at John Canvas. So this was the way I got into GC. I had a failing social networking startup at Stanford, which is a great place to get exposure to tech, startups, and a lot of people who are participating in this ecosystem. It wasn't by a lot of intention. Personality, I would say, because more serendipity. Mm -hmm. So I think what I found really fascinating is like you were originally from another country, right? And then like in Stanford, like it's a really competitive environment. Although you said like, you know, maybe there's more VCs than founders on campus, but still like, you know, getting into a good VC firm as well as like, you know, kind of building your own track record, it's like a lot of competition. And how do you kind of like, like, or curate your own kind of like network to make sure that you succeed? As well as like, you know, how do you like who is on your personal board of advisors on um, that, like, you know, in the career of venture since your parents came from medicine, and like, it's a like completely different field, like, how do you kind of like, 
build this up. And Yusuf's like really quiet, like not like quiet, but like mellow spoken and stuff like that. But like, you know, in Silicon Valley, we could see people would really, you know, out there and like have really big voice. How do you kind of like establish your own like kind of way of like, you know, socializing as well as like, you know, just build a successful network? So look, as you go through life, Uh, you can be intentional about collecting important people who can show you the ropes of whatever you want to learn about. And for me, it occurred in the beginning just because of serendipity. Like I happened to find myself in interesting places that inspired me to spend more time. So I met one person who recruited me to do a summer internship at a biomedical devices startup. While I was there, I met another person who was a professor at the Harvard Medical School, and he invited me to uh, do my thesis for my undergrad. Then when I came to um, SF uh, to go to Stanford, I met a professor at the school at the Department of Engineering, who was basically, you know, my savior because um, he sponsored me and gave me a research assistantship that let me pay for the very expensive but worth it Stanford tuition fees. While I was trying to start a company, um, we did it with with three of my awesome classmates, including myself, like two others. We were basically shameless enough to invite Mm -hmm. one of uh, LinkedIn's co-founders to join us on that journey that we met as a guest lecturer. And that guy had an awesome network and uh, we learned a lot from him. While we're at Stanford, I also so happened to network um, our way into what is now called Stardex. Back then it was called SSC Labs, which was like, you know, the YC of Stanford getting started at the time, which was like an awesome, awesome experience because they had the beginnings of a terrific network. Then I met a ton of founders, other investors at the time through them. When I joined the VC industry, I got fortunate to use my Greek origin and spent a lot of time in the early days with George Zachary, recently retired from CRV. And he was a career-long um, VC for a while when I met him, very well-known investor in the Valley, and he started like mentoring me. And I found this to be a very positive experience. So I started reaching out to other investors outside of uh, DC at the time to compare opportunities in the spaces that I cared about. So it's like becoming more intentional, in other words, of reaching out uh, mentors from very legit investors outside of my uh, firm. But the vast majority of the mentorship I've gone into my venture capital career, now 12 years in, has been at GC. I'm super grateful to my partners, Hamant uh, Joel Cutler, Adam Valkin, David Fialco, as well as others who are no longer here. Chris Farmer, who recruited me, uh, Neil Zakira at Defy Ventures, and several others that I've learned so much from over the years. So there are times, in other words, that you can uh, be intentional about seeking out mentors who over time change as you go through your career. And there are other times that serendipity uh, is very kind. Uh, if you find yourself in interesting places with interesting people who uh, will present themselves to you. I think this is very important, especially for those of us who were not born in the US or who were not um, very networked into Silicon Valley. The best way to hack the system is through identifying one or two mentors. Honestly, you, know, you don't need more than one or two. Mm. You just need to find the right people for whatever reason, are incentivized or motivated to spend time with you and show you the ropes. Would you find the people who are like similar to you or do you find they're the people who are like kind of like the opposite to you? I I mean, look, in the beginning when you're getting started, you got to use whatever it takes to find person number one, right? So in the Mm -hmm. case of VC for me, the very first one was Chris Farmer, um, who actually happened to get introduced to me through one of my classmates at Stanford. Um, Then the second one was George Zachary that I met through the Stardex experience. And he came in as a guest lecturer. I said, hey, I'm from Greece. He said his parents were from Greece and that's how we hit it off. So whatever it takes to find the first couple. What would you say would be like one skill that you're constantly trying to get better at? It could be like a sales skill since like VCs, a lot of it, or like even entrepreneurs, like everybody needs sales, but like, or like maybe technical skill or like some sort of like probably teach you how like how to think and like how, what are some skills that you personally trying to get better at? Yeah, I'm trying to get better at managing my own time right now because my role at our firm and 
the industry is uh, changing. So I unfortunately, you know, cannot be meeting with like 30 companies every week as I used mm-hmm. to till like a year ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, I need to be seeing some companies on my own and some companies mm-hmm. with a lot of my other awesome partners. Now I have a number of people who work with me on behalf of GZ. So I need to spend time teaching them uh, aspects of the job. Uh, so like retooling my time uh, is what I'm trying uh, to master. Uh, oh, another okay. one that I continue to try and become an innovator in is the art of cold email. Mm. In our industry, it's like one of the best ways to network yourself with whoever you want. And each one mm-hmm. of us who are fortunate enough to be in the tech and the startup industry in particular should become masters at cold emailing because it doesn't matter who you are. You can reach out to whoever, give them feedback about their product or whatever they're doing. Good chance to reply back. If they don't, you lose nothing. You can email them again next week. So especially when I was a student at Stanford in my early career at GC, I was cold emailing a ton of people, tens if not hundreds of people every week. And even now, mm-hmm. I try to cold email 10 to 15 people um, every week. If I don't do it, um, I feel really bad. So I'm trying to put in the time and continue to innovate on the actual content. It's getting easier now with all the AI stuff. Uh, cold email people. Do you feel like it's a numbers game or do you tailor it to like very specific stuff the person, you know, is about? Yeah, so for, for, it used to be a numbers game for me earlier mm-hmm. on in my career because I either didn't know what I was looking for or I didn't know what I was interested in. And mm-hmm. now it's like hearing about somebody <clears throat> or a product or a startup that captures my imagination. So it's very specific towards that. You are like extremely successful in venture. You invest in some of the top companies in like consumer tech as well as, um, you know, just like in crypto, in enterprise. So Discord, Snap, Audias are all like under your portfolio. Throughout these years, like since you work in venture for 12 years, I assume maybe like let's say like separate them into like three different phases I don't know if it's three for you but like let's say the beginning you probably have to enter the industry you have to kind of master deal sourcing and then in the middle part maybe you you are getting better at like you know identifying a company you know adding value helping them grow and then in the end like uh, now since you are like the managing director or managing partner at the fund so you probably have to essentially raise funding for the fund or like uh, thinking about how to run a fund how do you define your journey here and then what were some kind of main lessons that you've learned throughout the way excellent this is a very uh, loaded question that will give me the opportunity to reflect a bit so i would say broadly speaking the industry has three different types of people owners of the firms check writers and everybody else so mm-hmm. in certain firms that's very small ones the owners of the firms and the check writers are the same you know people mm-hmm. so during these three phases, I joined in the everybody else bucket. I would say <laughs> this was the Disneyland phase. So my first three, four years at GC, I felt like I was going to Disneyland every single day. I had an annual pass and it was phenomenal because mm-hmm. it also coincided with the rise of the App Store, the rise of AWS, um, the rise of open source software movement. And basically what happened is young millennials, People like me were coming up with startup ideas, building mostly mobile products, and they were getting a ton of traction mm-hmm. really quickly. So I was a young person who was going through the app store and called email link, any app developer whose app I really liked. Mm-hmm. So this was the Disneyland phase, and it coincided mm-hmm. with the golden years of consumer internet investing because distribution was really easy. So that's how we met the founders of Snap, Discord, Tinder, Instagram, Yik Yak, you name it. Some of them we invested in, some others we didn't. Shame on us. This let me uh, get promoted really quickly. <laughs> then I joined what I would describe as the really hard, you know, uh, time mm-hmm. in VC. For me, that was in the 2000, you know, like 15, 16, 17 uh, era when I exited the Disneyland phase and I became a tech writer. I was a young tech writer and the space that I had grown into, I grown up into the mobile first consumer internet app space was coming out of favor because distribution was becoming really hard and young consumer apps couldn't really get a lot of 
free users or acquire customers simply. So at that time, um, I'm very grateful uh, that my partners mentored me a lot, had patience with me, kept me around, um, ended up making the pivot towards investing in the future of workspace. Mm. So had the insight that Silicon Valley till then was largely focused uh, towards people like themselves, but there were large swaths of the labor pool that were not benefiting from all the innovations that technology could bring. So my idea was to combine capital with uh, technology um, as a force of good to help more individuals, solopreneurs, SMBs have access to a lot more opportunity, make more money, have more flexibility and uplevel themselves. So mm-hmm. through that time, I invested in vertical labor marketplaces and SMB the uh, SaaS with fintech uh, products targeting really boring professions um, for the Silicon Valley, you know, crowd. Mm-hmm. Nurses, locksmiths, carpet cleaners, maritime shipping crew members, electricians and plumbers in Germany, and also invested in some more, I would say, you know, futuristic future work companies like remote.com and collective.com. First one being global payroll compliance benefits for fully distributed companies and their remote workers. The second one, collective.com, being full back office for uh, businesses of one. So knowledge workers, solopreneurs can use collective to incorporate themselves as an escort, Mm -hmm. do payroll, bookkeeping, and their taxes uh, through it for a few hundred dollars a month. So this was phase number two, like Mm -hmm. becoming a check writer and leaning into the future of work investing space. Mm -hmm. And then phase number three is the last couple of years, frankly, as we've been slowly but steadily exiting from the pandemic. I realized that the next generation of founders are coming in Mm -hmm. into the mix, Gen Z years. They're like aliens who are about to conquer the entire Mm -hmm. planet. Um, They all live in the future in their heads. Mm -hmm. And the technical ones have a shot at actually building it and bringing the future they have in their heads to the world today. So since 2021, uh, alongside our team now here, most of our yeah. consumer team. Well, um, I've been focused on investing in technical Gen Z founders who are ideally leading fully technical teams and building products for themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, I continue to be an early stage investor, leading pre-seed, seed rounds, and of course, you know, series A rounds if there is product market fit. Um, and we want to invest in fast learning animals who are ridiculously ambitious, Mm-hmm. and are the customers of their own products. We don't care if these products are in you know, online dating, dev tools for the really nerdy ones or crypto for the believers. Mm-hmm. All we care about is the founders are building a product for themselves. So mm-hmm. during this you know, new phase, the last uh, couple of years, it's been great to work alongside our awesome team here, meeting with founders who are not people like me because they're younger than me. Now 38, mm-hmm. 90% of the founders I meet with are younger than 30. Gen Z years mm-hmm. or now the oldest or 26. Also, it's the most diverse generation because demograph- the demographics have spoken. They definitely are like people who don't look like me. So that's also a very interesting uh, learning uh, opportunity. Like small detail that you mentioned, it's like you would invest in Gen Z founders that are technical. I would argue that like that should be changing due to like, you know, there's so much like no code tools out there. And then especially now, like, you know, uh, uh, chat gpt is happening so i feel like more and more like uh people who are non-technical can also build really successful companies like what's your thought on that and like speaking of gen z you know you invest in a company called 222 and like you know do you want to share more about like you know compared to the discord snap uh slash audience age that like you know what's what's your investment different in this Gen Z zone and like, you know, in terms of like looking at the funders, looking at the team, like how does that evolve? If you are somebody who's technical or you're like a product mind who has Mm -hmm. recruited technical people, your advantage is that you can build stuff really quickly, especially when you're really young, you're very passionate, but you don't have experience. The first product idea may not be the right one. Like Mm -hmm. for whatever reason, it may not work, either because the timing is not good or because your execution for that particular idea is not good. However, if you are technical or you're a product mind who's leading a technical team, Mm -hmm. you can iterate really quickly. 
what I've seen is when we invest in awesome business people who don't have a technical team at all, mm -hmm. or they themselves are trying to hack it with no code stuff, much slower pivoting into the new idea. And as an investor, what you care about is for the companies you invest in, especially at the very early stage, to have multiple shots on goal if the first idea doesn't work out. Very often, and you see this with YC all the time. Mm -hmm. Teams apply with one idea, a demo dates, another idea they're pitching, mm -hmm. and then they succeed two years later with the third idea. What is mm -hmm. the um, most common, you know, denominator of the successful teams? Having technical or ideally fully technical founders who can make this, you know, pivot very, very quickly. Look, those people are digital natives, like Gen Z years grew up with the internet. They don't remember a time before the internet. The products they grew up with, Minecraft, Roblox, Fortnite, pretty epic, you know, like experiences. Because over there, in each one of them, you're both a maker as well as a consumer. You can hang out with friends. You can make new friends, people you don't know. You can play the game. In the case of Fortnite, you can enjoy experiences from famous artists who come in and uh, perform. You can create your own phenomenal world and start making money out of it. Consumer products that geriatric millennials like myself have built that are the face of the internet today. Which are these, you know, Instagram, Facebook, <laughs> Tinder, Twitch, Reddit, just to name a few, you know, they don't offer you all this kind of like versatile set of experiences. So if you're like a Gen Zer graduating from Fortnite into Instagram, you're like, oh my God, you know, it's a single use case kind of product. It's not like I cannot fully express, you know, myself. Every generation is different than, you know, those before them. I think we millennials really love showing off. Vanity has no ceiling for us. Mm -hmm. And Gen Zers are more private than us. We millennials are more touchy filly. Gen Zers happen to grow up at a time when their parents had a hard time during the mm -hmm. financial crisis. So they're a lot more pragmatic and ruthless than us. So they are eager to make money sooner. They're not the kind of people who have patience to deal with middlemen. So they're mm -hmm. different, you know, traits that they possess that will get inevitably, you know, big influencing factors in the products they're building. How do you kind of like quickly study this market? It seems like I think about Gen Z, I kind of think about like it's a subsector of what you've invested in. And like, you know, you mentioned like at the beginning, people are investing in uh, the social network era. And then there is in, in the middle, you pivot into investing like the not the 5%, but the 95% of people in the world who are like, you know, more uh, towards like the regular people than like the Silicon Valley people. And then now Gen Z, I feel like it's a different subsector that like you probably have to study different sector um, like that and like curious when you are studying Gen Z like we said maybe uh, you know chatting with people uh, who are like founders what are some other ways that you kind of try to understand this uh, whole like new group of people uh, rule number one is to spend a lot of time with them right Mm -hmm. um, that's what you do and it's other people who you collect over the internet and it's great now you know with <laughs> Twitter, with TikTok, with Discord, mm -hmm. especially the last two. This is where your Gen Zers, you know, hang out and live. Uh, Snapchat as well. Uh, you have conversations with them. I've had the privilege of like working with five of them here at GC. They're very vocal. They're different than <laughs> me. And they educate me every single day. Then over the last couple of years, I've invested in almost, you know, like uh, 20 of different, you know, um, mm -hmm. early stage teams led by Gen Zers. And mm -hmm. they have a lot of other friends. So they introduce us, you know, to their friends. Mm -hmm. And then if you just go online, um, there are already a bunch of surveys, reports that are coming out, explaining to the world how they're different and what they really care about. Like everything in life, there's no silver bullet. It's like a series of different tactics you can employ to optimize your learning. Some people learn from just thinking because they're really good thinkers. Some others learn from reading and some others learn from doing or meeting people, right? Um, so I tried to do a bit of everything. When you are like thinking about like investing in Gen Z asset category, like what are some subsector that you're focusing on? And like, I, th I think at the beginning of investing is probably a numbers game. Like, you know, you've seen a lot of companies and you put some money into some companies and see how it goes. And since like, you know, you've already invested in like over 20 companies in this Gen Z founder zone, like what were some learning that you've took, um, you know, after investing in the 
strategies like 20 coming and then how did how does that shape you into like the future investing strategies again it's not just me investing in all these 20 companies we have a team so at gc mm -hmm. we invest in positive and powerful chains that endures we invest mm -hmm. in consumer enterprise crypto fintech mm -hmm. and healthcare i help participate in all things early stage that we do mm -hmm. Uh, and if it's like a Gen Z founder or team, I get involved. But it's not that I'm the lead investor, you know, for all mm -hmm. 20, you know, different teams. We literally uh, hear a lot about investing in founders who are learning uh, really quickly. Mm -hmm. We hear a lot about investing in founders who are very ambitious because we have large funds. We hear a ton about investing in founders who are leaders. Do they have a following? Can they recruit others? Can they uh, network with mm -hmm. the people who will do stuff for free for them? Uh, mm -hmm. And given this particular, you know, like category, young people normally, for example, if you just go and spend all of your time with college students who are entrepreneurial. They care about what they're going to have for lunch or dinner. They care about their social life, romantic or making new friends. And they care a ton about their academic and how do I find a summer or temporary or full-time job kind of life. So these are the three big, you know, categories of problems that college students, for example, want to solve. So inevitably, at least half of the companies that we've invested in, led by Gen Zers, are building consumer-facing uh, products to solve this kind of problems that I just mm -hmm. uh, described. And it's a great time, actually, now to be building a consumer-facing company, mm -hmm. because once again, like how it was in the 2009 to let's say 2000, you know, 13 era, distribution mm -hmm. is starting to become accessible and affordable. Mm -hmm. If you know how to play TikTok, you can get millions of users for free. If you know how to do community management on Discord, you can get tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of users for free. If you know how to do paid uh, mm -hmm. stuff on TikTok or Snap. Now, especially that the larger brands are uh, pulling back, you can uh, acquire customers with a good ROI. When you have a time when distribution is becoming accessible or affordable for young startups, then some of them may become the ones that scale over time. Mm. And we're in that phase right now. So I would say half of what I do is consumer facing. So like basically you're saying there's like a difference switch between like how do you acquire customer in the past, maybe people through like ads, but now like people are through like building a large like social media flowing or like a community uh, through like organic reach. What's your overall thoughts on like this like influencer economy or like creator economy, uh, such as, you know, like nowadays, like a lot of billion dollar company are started by like major youtube stars and do you feel like this is like the future or like do you feel like it's very it's only like you know two people can do it per 10 years yeah so i would say like for the millennial generation mm -hmm. making money online mm -hmm. as a career option sounded crazy yes we knew of like Mm -hmm. I don't know, 50 YouTubers who could do it, but it's like saying those are the 50 very notable singers or actors. Mm -hmm. For the Gen Z generation to believe that you can make money from the internet as a career option, it's actually a believable uh, thing. Uh, mm -hmm. Why is that? Because there are so many different places where you now can have a following you have a reputation and there's so many different ways to express yourself so mm -hmm. are you good in like short form video great are you good at long form writing great mm -hmm. are you awesome at creating anime content awesome there are all these different places where you can practice whatever you know your craft is get better over time when you're young your opportunity cost is pretty low you have plenty mm -hmm. of time and because of some of the social networks that are becoming uh, large quickly for your generation mm -hmm. probably tiktok or you know discord in more recent years you can have a distribution channel the challenge is that being an online content creator and being a business person these are like two very different you know like uh, skill sets that somebody has to master and mm -hmm. it's like saying, I'm a really good engineer and I'm a really good CEO. Those are two different jobs, right? Mm -hmm. Most online content creators are not awesome business people. Mm -hmm. So we've seen over the last few years, a ton of tooling or infrastructure companies like collective.com we invested in that are trying to work with this crowd so that the creators can enjoy what they do the or they are the best at. You know, these other companies take care of the back office work, for example. Have we seen already massive, massive 
companies in the creator economy? Actually, not that many. I would say the hype is way ahead, you know, mm-hmm. of where that uh, category is real. Probably the most important and controversial, of course, creator economy startup or company is OnlyFans. That, of course, you know, a controversial mm-hmm. one given the nature of work. But if we could have other companies like them that can help people really, you know, make um, a couple of thousand dollars a month, this could be truly mm-hmm. revolutionary because with that amount, you can live in most places in the US or the world uh, mm-hmm. and have a decent income, you know. Let, let's say like if I'm a Gen Z founder today, you and I, like let's say you are a Gen Z founder, we're starting a company together. How would you approach this like, you know, fundraising phase of your company let's say like we're raising money from like all the silicon valley vcs like what are going to be some like you know steps that we should take to you know successfully raise i would go and spend time uh, with you with some other gen z founders in our network Mm -hmm. who have gone through that process successfully Mm -hmm. and would ask them for advice that's Mm -hmm. job number one Job number Mm -hmm. two, uh, we would find one or two mentors Mm -hmm. who are older than us, who've done Mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. And we would also ask them for advice and introduction. Mm -hmm. Hopefully through uh, one of these intros, we would get connected to a really good attorney who works for Mm -hmm. one of the major firms uh, that only does venture financing and has Mm -hmm. a lot of experience so that he or he could offer us good advice, especially when the time, you know, Mm -hmm. comes for us to incorporate and to deal with like understanding and term C. <laughs> then I would make it like a full-time job for like a mm-hmm. month to get it done because fundraising is a momentum-based activity because if you do it like as a dis- disjointed activity, it will drag mm-hmm. on and you'll be hurting cats for a long time. So it would be very frustrating. We would try our hardest not to get to be upset by no's, especially by people that we've been following online or we've been dreaming about receiving an offer from try our best to be like okay we're one new or closer to a yes and mm. uh, the whole job is to get the first offer and if we're lucky we'll get many more after that okay so two questions there number one is let's say we found a mentor who are a little bit older than us and uh, who introduced us to an attorney and then will the attorney like kind of introduce us to like all the top vcs since like it's essentially pitching especially for first-time founders it's kind of like a numbers game i've heard over a million times like a lot of people after asking you know 50 100 200 people and then finally the 400 was a yes. What is like a general number that you should be thinking would be like a normal number to ask to, you know, to get the money? And then like, how do you ask like for the people who did not raise until like the 100th investor they, they were talking to, they have to talk to a 100 investor first. How would you go about getting that list up? So look, what I would say is like, the best way to get intros is from either the couple of mentors that you're going to sign up or other uh, founders in your own space, like other Gen Zers in our case, who raised mm-hmm. recently money. And we would ask them for intros to the investors who invested in them, right? Indeed, you know, what I would do is I would try to talk to 15 um firms in the beginning or investors. Uh, I would bucket them into three buckets, you know, like Dream investors, good investors I would be okay to work with, Mm -hmm. and others that I would be practice around with if I had no other option. Mm. I wouldn't actually go and talk to anyone that if they were my only offer, that I wouldn't be excited, you know, to work with them. But like there are different levels of excitement for everything in life, right? I would pull two, three names from each one of these buckets and would go and talk to them during the first week. As I receive feedback. I will tweak, you know, the pitch. And as people are dropping out, uh, I will be adding other folks from these three different buckets. If none of the 15 are excited to uh, make an offer, then um, you have two options. One is mm-hmm. to really understand why people are saying no. If it's for the same reason, actually go back, do some work, try to rectify that. And then, you know, hit them up, same people or new ones. If it's like, for many different reasons and you're like 
completely excited about this specific idea, it's fine. Go and find another 15, you know, names. Mm. It's often good at the pre-seed or seed stage to raise the first few hundred K from angel investors so that you have some momentum. And normally angel investors, at least during the good times, tend to be uh, faster to uh, say yes because they don't need to go and talk to their partners, et cetera, et cetera. It is indeed, you know, in some ways, a numbers-based activity. However, what I would say to you is like, if you just like try to concentrate and do everything in three, four weeks, you could like really have a much higher chances of success mm. first meetings you could do on zoom too so like mm. this is like a great way to spend 30 minutes with somebody mm-hmm. and both sides of the table can see if it makes sense to spend more time together if you can have like 15 back-to-back meetings uh, in a few days, it's much more efficient than you driving, worrying about parking, or like paying a lot of money on Lyft and Uber, showing up at people's offices, etc. You know, like we chat about founders, but nowadays, like not only Gen Z, but like literally everyone is a half like part-time investor due to like the success of like Angelus or like, you know, Twitter, like a lot of people are building like some sort of like social followings online nowadays. And like, I'm curious, like in terms of like starting uh, a fund or like running a successful fund how would you like kind of like shape your portfolio early on to kind of like getting that momentum getting a fund started and putting yourself in front of like all the successful founders look in venture capital you are as good looking as as the top investments you've made over the last five years it's a constantly a struggle right Mm-hmm. Uh, it doesn't mean that if you invested in some awesome people 10 years ago, now you can just hang out. Um, <laughs> so if I were to be starting a new fund today, I would try to do it with people that we have excellent work chemistry. Because mm-hmm. it's like a wedding, like marriage, but without divorce. Because if there is a divorce, it's very, very, very painful. And LPs really care about the uh, chemistry, the body language of the especially emerging managers that they're investing into. I would be trying to find others that you have worked with before in the past who ideally can complement you really, really nicely. Maybe, you know, mm-hmm. you're the awesome fundraiser. Maybe they are the most unbelievable people, talent magnets to attract founders. Or maybe you're the kind of person who has a very extreme point of view in a good way mm-hmm. about a very specific market. The other person is like the networker type who will go and network themselves with very interesting people in many different, you know, types of industries. Mm -hmm. So, but the whole idea is to start a fund with others that you have an excellent work relationship with. Mm -hmm. You see eye to eye about where you want to drive this uh, toward, and you're going to be working together for at least a decade. Mm. Second thing I would do is I would go and talk to two different types of mentors. Emerging managers who are two, three years ahead. I believe there's a people who are have now just successfully raised you know, funds too mm-hmm. and learn from them and give you analytical feedback of everything, you know, that mm-hmm. they wish they had done differently. Mm-hmm. And then the second bucket would be have mentors in other more established VC firms who can help offer uh, advice around fundraising building a firm, recruiting, portfolio construction, etc. Mm. Through these different types of mentors, I would start getting intros to limited partners. Mm. Uh, because the same way that founders are better off receiving intros from fellow founders who have raised from um, their VCs, the same way applies in the venture capital uh, industry when VCs want to raise capital from LPs. So it's better to have like warm interest and not waste, mm-hmm. you know, any time. I would anticipate that fundraising for emerging managers, especially right now, 2023 mm-hmm. and not in 2021 or 22, it's going to be hard. Mm-hmm. And it may take a year mm-hmm. or even longer to get something done. If you have a track record, Maybe easier. Mm-hmm. If you or your partner or partners don't have a track record, assume it's going to take some time. Uh, and that's okay. That's like normal. Don't have any FOMO that, oh my God, we're not investing in the hot day ideals that are going <laughs> down the drain. It's okay. The way I would be thinking about it is that, oh my God, as soon as we have a pool of capital to invest in, now it's an amazing time to be an early stage investor because mm-hmm. you have new talent coming in. 
Gen Zers, for example, liberated talent from overvalued private or public companies coming into the mix as founders and new technologies uh, coming into the mix. AI stuff at a time when capital is becoming more scarce and competition is also becoming more scarce because not every space gets funded in two weeks, you know? by VCs. Mm. So founders have more time. So it's okay if it takes one year to raise the capital, but as soon as if you're on the other side of it, you'll be able to get better uh, investment opportunities led by true founders, not tourists, at better valuations than in the last few years. When, so be, like, be, pa- be patient and not take no for an answer, in other words, you know? And remember yeah. that when you talk to LPs, it's the beginning of a relationship, even if it's institutional ones. If they, even if they say no to you now, you will have to raise, you know, fund two or fund three mm-hmm. in the future. So they want to see how you perform, how you make progress, etc. By the way, like in terms of like interacting with LPs for the first time, would, would it be mostly from warm interest? or like I think in China we have these like uh, agencies that they help you connect you with LPs I don't know if this is the same case in the US yeah that, that's why I suggested you know the best way to get intros is through emerging managers who recently raised fund one and fund two mm-hmm. or through uh, having like mentors who work mm-hmm. at established firms and they would introduce you to their LPs if you can't like get enough leads through that uh, there are events where LPs go and hang out. Uh, there are indeed, you know, some of them who are more vocal online in more recent <laughs> years. Not as many as the VCs, of course, who are excellent <laughs> self-promoters. You could um, also work with like a placement agent or like an advisor mm-hmm. who could help you for a fee, of course, tee mm-hmm. up more uh, LPs. This is unlikely, though, the case for a new emerging fund manager to do, especially if they're raising like a early stage fund, like a mm-hmm. 20 or 150, $200 million early stage fund. Wait, like why? Would, what's the motivation? Let's say like you are a, in an established fund. Let's say an emerging fund manager come to you. What were some motivations for you to introduce them to like, let's say like your LPs? Uh, it could be somebody I've known for a long time, right? It could be one mm-hmm. of our founders who has also had an Intel track record. Mm-hmm. Now they're starting a fund with like a friend of theirs and I think highly of. So I want to pay it forward and uh, help them out. Mm. Also, it could be somebody that I see as a, a potential future strong collaborator. Mm. Like it could be an individual who already has been helping us out uh, identify opportunities or already help existing portfolio companies of ours. And I think that they do deserve to become uh, VCs. They want to be entrepreneur VCs starting their own firm. And I see them as awesome collaborators in the future. So I'm eager, you know, to help them out. I think you build a really strong online presence. And regardless if it's like LinkedIn or Twitter, especially LinkedIn, like I feel like you're constantly posting really interesting statuses. And I still remember some status you post like maybe two, three years ago. And then I was like, it was getting a lot of engagement as well as like, it, it was really, you know, interesting to read. And how do you kind of, nowadays, like every VC is super paying attention to their social media presence. It kind of became a table stake for like everybody to spending a lot of time on social media. And like, how would you establish a strong brand for yourself if you are starting today? There are many different ways to start establishing a reputation as a venture capitalist. The hardest one is to invest in really awesome companies that do really well, Mm -hmm. because this takes a long time Mm -hmm. when you can see the results. Not everything you do to establish a brand has to be online. You may be the most incredible person organizing intimate dinners, phenomenal people attend, and this creates some word of mouth for you. At the end of the day, your brand is what other people say about yourself. When you're getting started, I think it's more important to be deliberate about what space you want to spend real time with and who are the three, four people in that space that are going to serve as collaborators for you. And they're going to be telling all their friends or contacts, oh my God, go and talk to Nico because of ABC. So you don't need to be amazing at doing anything online in order to get this done. If you want to do online stuff, I would strongly encourage you to do something that comes more natively to you. Because if writing long form is not the way to do and it's really painful, it feels like a laborious task. In the busy day of a VC, that's a grind, you're not going to do that. 
mm-hmm. also choose a platform that's growing quickly. If like you're getting started today, doing stuff on Twitter that's not growing quickly, not sure if it's a great use of time. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you want to invest in Gen Z years, Discord and TikTok are probably the places to be today. So you want to go, in other words, in places where the type of content that is popular natively comes to you and this is where the audience that you want to attract uh, hangs out. And it's a growing platform. So you can leverage, you know, the growth of the platform with you putting in a lot more time and effort. As it's been famously said before, and all these, you know, consumer social companies, users are the product, right? If they tend to grow on their own, it's great news for you. Otherwise, tough luck. Worst thing for you would be if it's a platform that's not growing quickly or even, you know, shuts down in a few years. We'll have put in some much time and end up, you know, with nothing. Okay, so we're at the last um, one minute fire round section. So uh, I have a couple questions for you. Number one is like, what's your favorite book? For the venture capital industry is a power law. Mm. Uh, so this is one that walks readers through the history of uh, venture capital industry. It was published, I think, a couple of years ago by Sebastian Malaby. And mm-hmm. I strongly encourage, you know, anyone who's interested in VC to read it. Who made the biggest impact in your career? It, it goes through phases, but certainly over the last decade, my awesome partner, Haman Neza. Who uh, would you invite to your dinner party? My wife, of course. <laughs> Where can we find you outside of work? Walking around uh, Soma or Soho in New York. What do you consider as your unfair advantage? I think I'm really good at connecting with uh, people from various tracks of life. Amazing. Thank you so much, Nico, for coming on the show today. Great. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a joy. I appreciate you putting in all this time and effort to get to know me a bit from afar. Thank you. It showed.